and Audacity in three, two, one. What's up, guys, and welcome back to the Barbell Lifestyle Podcast. And today we have a very special guest that we are so excited to announce with an awesome topic, a super underrated topic, I would say. And so today we have Shravya Kovella here with us talking about pelvic floor health. And so we're going to go through all of the ins and outs of what pelvic floor health is, you know, what it impacts, how can you improve it? What are signs that you have uh, poor pelvic health and, you know, basically giving everyone the ins and outs of this topic that is so under discussed. So I'm super excited to have Shravya shed some light on it. So I guess the first thing to do is to introduce you. So why don't you give us a quick introduction as to who you are and what you do? and then we'll dive right in. Yeah. So, hey everyone, my name is Shravya. Like Marissa said, I am a pelvic floor physical therapist. So what that means is I do have my doctor of physical therapy, but I took additional courses and certifications to specifically treat pelvic health and pelvic floor. Um, so I am also business development manager at a company called Pelvidol. So we have a product on the market right now for specifically for pelvic floor strengthening and stress urinary incontinence. So my role there is really a lot on the education side, reaching out to the clinical world and seeing how essentially our product and our service can continue to contribute to the pelvic health community and improve access to pelvic floor. Um, I'm sure we'll get into it today, but there's just such an underserved population and such an underserved um, area in the medical field. So the more we can talk about it, and I want to encourage everyone to hopefully walk away from this, just feeling a little bit more comfortable and empowered to talk about pelvic health. Um, So yeah, that's a little bit about me. I also have my board, my board specialization in orthopedics, um, meaning that I'm basically super passionate about everything with peeing, pooping, sex, anything that you can think of. I've got no personal bubble there, um, but also have worked with athletes of all ages, um, worked with uh, people of all uh, backgrounds who have lofty goals or just want to get back to like being able to play with their kids or grandkids or, you know, whatever is important to them. So happy to be here. Yeah. Thanks so much for being on. And it's awesome that you have just like such a vast understanding of like the pelvic floor and everything that it touches and affects. So I guess the first thing to do is just define the pelvic floor, because I'll be honest. So Christina and I, like we have both gone through the pre and post natal certification through girls gone strong, which is one of the top certifications or probably one of the only uh, well-rounded certifications for pre and postnatal. Uh, so the pelvic floor is obviously very involved with, you know, pregnancy or however you want to phrase that, but the pelvic floor was not something that I like knew was a term or knew existed mm-hmm. as a female until I literally was brought, uh, this certification was brought to my attention. I started taking it. So it's just crazy to me that like I was, 23 years old at the time, got the certification, had no idea what my pelvic floor was, but I've been living with it my whole life. And like, there's so many different things that it affects. So I guess first just uh, define that for us. What is the pelvic floor? Yeah. So um, the pelvic floor, I want to make it really broad first and say that the pelvic floor is basically a group of muscles. So the reason it's called a floor is because it's at kind of the base of our pelvis. So this group of muscles, they run from your tailbone to your pubic bone. So if we're thinking kind of front to back of the pelvis, and then also from sit bone to sit bone. So just like we have muscles anywhere else in our body, we've got muscles in our shoulders that help us lift up our arms. We've got muscles in our thighs that help us kick soccer balls. We've got muscles in our pelvis that help us with things that we do every day that we don't really think about unless there's something wrong. So these muscles, a lot of times when we say pelvic floor, we're referring to just this group of muscles together, but it's actually a little bit more nuanced than that. We have three layers of our pelvic floor muscles. So each of these layers play a different role, but 
The main role of your pelvic floor is to help you with these activities such as going to the bathroom, such as being able to stabilize your pelvis in your spine when you're lifting things or when you're bending, twisting, moving. So pelvic floor muscles are basically doing things for you every day, even when you're not thinking about it. Did that answer your question or did I go off on a tangent? <laughs> no, that, I think that's great. Um, yeah. And I think so we have the three layers of the pelvic floor muscles. I don't know if it would be of value to go into those or just like yeah. what function these serve kind of in more applied circumstances. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, the first layer we call the urogenital triangle. So that basically um, is looking at if you if you were in my shoes and you were doing an internal exam on someone, you're looking at um, their vaginal opening and their rectal opening. So where we're looking at that triangle is right externally. It's almost like a diamond around that area. So that area has muscles as well. So actually when you go see a pelvic floor PT or an OBGYN, um, whatever it is, we're not just doing an internal exam. We're also looking at the muscles externally as well, because those muscles play a role with say your sexual function. So for example, where the clitoris sits, there are muscles around there and glands that help us with sexual arousal, that help us with orgasm, um, with desire. So if those muscles are tight or painful, or they don't have the ability to move, that can actually impact all of those things that we don't even think about being associated with muscles. So we've got muscles on that first layer. Our second layer is going to be more about um, the connective tissue that helps us with our bladder, with being able to release our um, urine. So that will have the external urethral sphincter, which is basically just a fancy way of saying what controls us, the ability for us to be able to release urine and pee when we need to, or be able to hold it back. So that's more of the second layer. The third layer is what everyone thinks of when we talk about pelvic floor muscles. So those are the muscles that just like when you contract your bicep, you kind of can see the muscle like bulging, you know, and seeing that muscle contract and shorten. If we are testing your pelvic floor muscle strength, that's the layer that will test your strength. And so the way I describe it is when someone is contracting their pelvic floor, imagine it almost as like a jellyfish. You know how jellyfish swim where they kind of do like this? I know that not everyone's watching this video, but basically it's, you can kind of imagine when like jellyfish, they almost like squeeze and, and move. So when we're testing pelvic floor strength, we're looking for a squeeze, but also a lift. So that's really the full ability to use your pelvic floor muscles. It's almost like if I could flex my bicep great, but I want to be able to move it throughout its full range of motion. And so this kind of goes back to that idea of your pelvic floor muscles are so similar to other muscles in our body and should really be treated the same because they're doing they're, they're functioning in very similar ways. They squeeze, they contract, and they lift to support you. I think it's super important to point out that if we haven't already lost any of our male listeners, <laughs> that both men and women have pelvic floors. So I think yes. that again, when Marissa and I were going through our certifications, we were reading and we were like, wait, men can do Kegels. <laughs> <laughs> totally. And we were so surprised. And so I think, um, and I, you know, of course I was telling my husband, I was like, did you know that you can do a Kegel? And he's like, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think it is important to, to talk about this, to bring it up, to make people aware, both men and women to see what they can do if they have or if they are having any, any issues, but of course, just to understand more of like how their body works and operates. Yeah, that's a great point. And a lot of men will ask me, they'll be like, well, how do you even check out my pelvic floor? Um, and some don't like to hear this, but it is rectally. That's how we do it. Uh, and like you said, Christina, like men and women have pelvic floor and believe it or not, there are issues that men have, unfortunately, with their pelvic floor that can be helped. And I always say like, there are not enough people talking about pelvic health for women. There are definitely not enough people talking about pelvic health for men. Um, and even if we can go from there into other parts of the population, like the transgender community or um, LGBTQ, there's just so many underserved populations there. But 
anyone who has a pelvis has a pelvic floor. So that's your takeaway. <laughs> that's a good, yeah, that's a good overarching. Okay. You know, if, if you qualify in this way, unless you've had your pelvis removed, for exactly. whatever reason, you're good. You have a pelvic floor. So I think one thing to, to kind of go into now is what is a normal versus an abnormal function of the pelvic floor? Because at least through what I've learned and you can confirm or deny this, there's a lot of different kinds of dysfunctions that you can have and symptomology mm-hmm. that you can have with the pelvic floor, not just too loose, but too tight and different kinds of, and degrees of prolapse and all those things. So first let's talk about what is normal and what is good function. And then what are common dysfunctions that we see? Yeah, that is a great question. And I think I want to start off with saying, starting off broader. And that means that if you or anyone, you know, ever has anything feeling unpleasant, any discomfort with your um, pelvic region around uh, going to the bathroom, whether that's peeing or pooping with sexual intimacy, anytime anything feels off, trust yourself, trust your gut, recognize that you are not making up you know, things in your head. It's just something that we don't talk about. So that's kind of the first thing I want to put out there in terms of what normal function is. If we're going to dive in a little bit deeper, I'm going to say that it basically is what you would expect any other muscle to be able to do. So we want to see that your muscles can turn on, meaning they can contract properly, that they can relax properly. So you're not walking around with your muscles, just contracted and tightened all day, but you're also not walking around with them being totally relaxed because we know that they have to turn on when we're in the car and there's a ton of traffic and we're trying to hold back our urine so we can make it to the bathroom in time. That's when we say thank you to our pelvic floor muscles. Um, So we want to see them be able to function that way. But the one step further with that, that we may not think about with certain other muscles is we want to be able to control them properly. So the way I think about that is if I'm reaching for my coffee cup in the morning, I do this without even thinking about it because my muscles are able to do this. My brain is able to coordinate and and communicate with my muscles, but I can reach for my coffee cup, make sure I reach just far enough, use enough force to lift it. So I'm not like, you know, slamming it up to the ceiling and then I can bring it to my mouth. I can sip it. I can put it down like all with the proper amount of force and use of muscles, kind of the same thing with your pelvic floor muscles. But the hard part about that is when was the last time that you actively thought to my thought to yourself where you were like, oh, okay, I'm going to turn them on now. And all right, that's good. I'm going to hold them and I'm going to let them go. You know, I like, I don't think anyone's ever told me that they can do that when they can't come in. And I will, I have checked out a lot of pelvic floors and nine out of 10 times the pelvic floor contraction, that brain muscle connection is not all that great. And so just becoming aware of those muscles and being able to turn them on, turn them off is really important. Um, it's kind of like I say, like you can be a really strong, I think Christine, I said this to you the other day, like you can be a really strong person. You can go to the gym, you can lift weights. Um, but that doesn't make you a fantastic like tennis player or a dancer. So having that specific coordination skills is really important. So that's what we're looking at for normal pelvic floor function. Like you are able to empty your bladder fully. You don't have any pain with urinating, no abdominal pain or pain with like um, having a bowel movement, like going to the bathroom, you feel like you're going regularly. So that is generally one to two, every one to two days. Um, I'm just going to put this PSA out there. A lot of the world is constipated and we don't realize (laughs) it. (laughs) It's like patients will come into my clinic all the time when I was practicing and they'd be like, I say, oh, so do you have any issues with like your bowel movements? I'd be like, oh, no, 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 I'm totally fine. I'm like, okay, well, do you have any constipation? No. And I'd be like, how often are you going to the bathroom? Oh, I don't go that often. Like maybe every four days, you know, (laughs) or they'll be like, you know, someone else would be like, yeah, I can go, but it's kind of like pebbles. It's, it's just, we don't really talk about it, but our gut health and how our pelvic floor functions is so tied in with those things that 
Like, isn't there a ch children's book out there? Like literally everybody poops. So that is so important for us to be able to function well. Um, and so that's going to be important. The other functions of your pelvic floor include, so that's kind of more sphincter control, we can say, supporting your pelvis and your back and the rest of your body is really important. So your pelvic floor is one of the main muscles of your core. So if you have low back pain, for example, that's unresolved, pelvic floor can actually be contributing to that. And um, one thing I remember that was really interesting to me and kind of want, made me want to learn more about pelvic health before I was even in it was when I was in my orthopedic residency and studying for my boards. And I was looking at the evidence behind what is an indication or an increased risk factor for low back pain, because the U.S. is a country we spend more money treating chronic low back pain than cancer. So it is a, it is a big deal. Um, and the risk factors of urinary incontinence and poor breathing, like breathing difficulties or allergies actually are lead to increased risk of low back pain than BMI and inactivity. So that should tell us something like, wow, urinary incontinence, breathing difficulties, like how our pelvic floor is functioning is so related with low back pain. And so many people have low back pain that should really tell us something. So yeah, our pelvic floor does a lot for us. I love this because we talk about poop and we talk about back pain love it. so much, like, especially on this podcast for people who like do really stick around and listen to our full episodes and all of that. And so I like how all of these things have kind of been brought in almost full circle because, you know, you click on this episode and we're you know, 15 minutes in. And usually at this point, this is when someone decides I'm going to keep listening. Or I'm going to stop listening. And it, you know, it's like, okay, what is the pelvic floor? Cool. This isn't making any sense, but if we can really bring this in back to those sorts of things. And I will say this too, like on our client uh, check-in forms, we have our, we ask our clients, like, how are you doing with your bowel movements? Like, what, what does that look like? Are you having any issues with it? And like, I'm going to go in there. I'm gonna make that question more specific. Like how many times are you going per day or per week? Because like most of the time it's, oh, I don't have any issues, but you're right. Like people, I, I feel like I see like a new TikTok or reel every day. That's like a joke about how like women just, you know, don't poop as often as they should. And like, it's, it's funny. It's a joke because like our boyfriends go like three times a day, but like, it's, it's just interesting <laughs> to kind of see that, that dynamic and then, and then see, okay, what is actually normal. And so it kind of like really tying that into this and then seeing where people can take the value from learning more about their pelvic floor to improve all qualities of their life. Yeah. And you guys are so much further than like, so many other medical practices just by including that. I think that it's something that like primary care docs across the whole country should include on their intake forms. And um, I'm pretty sure it's like recommended to by plenty of organizations out there, but unfortunately it's just not, it's just not, we just don't talk about it. So I think that's that you guys are already so far ahead of like what so many other people are doing. So that's huge. Yeah. And I think while we are talking about frequency, kind of like you mentioned, like pebbles, kind of like what's the consistency of your stool. And I know we're getting like on a mm. tangent about poop, but <laughs> always um, a good tangent. <laughs> right. But I feel like I can't remember when it was, but I think it was on Instagram. Like I saw an infographic about like the types, the consistency and, and kind of how there's a scale and it kind of tells you like, where you are, what's normal, what's not normal. And it's just kind yeah. of, yeah, we know everyone goes, but like, how often should we go? What should it look like? How should it yeah. feel? And all those things. So I think it's, it's really important uh, to think about that and, and kind of, I don't know, take note of it <laughs> and yeah. kind of like what your normal is and figure out like what you can do to adjust it, to make it a little more optimal. Mm -hmm. And so for anyone who's interested, you can Google Bristol stool chart and see where you are on that. And we should all aim to be at a stage four, at a level four is kind of the goal. Um, so you can kind of see like, what side am I falling to? What's the consistency like, like Christina said. And sometimes people have great consistency of their stool and can empty their bladder, you know, like they're going long enough when they're peeing, but they just have difficulty releasing or relaxing their muscles. 
And so maybe they're going multiple times throughout the day because they're never fully emptying their bladder or emptying their bowels. Um, sometimes you see that with people who exercise and will start exercising. It'll be like a trigger. It'll be like, oh, wait, now I have to go to the bathroom five times during this one hour exercise session. So what's going on with your muscles? Are you able to coordinate them with the movements that you're doing or are they getting tight? Are you not able to hold back your urine during this impact of additional exercise? Um, so it all plays a role. They all work together. You know, I have a note on that. That's interesting. You know, you mentioned the trigger with exercise because I've, I've forget who it is, but I'm thinking of someone who I know, like that was like their notorious thing. Like as soon as they started training, they'd have to go number two. And I would always think that that's just the weirdest thing from like basic, like physiological knowledge of like, well, when you start exercising, like you're, you're releasing, you know, norepinephrine and adrenaline. So like your body should be going into more of a sympathetic state where like rest and digest isn't happening. So like, why is this person going to the bathroom when they start exercising? So that never made sense to me. So to have you point that out and be like, Hey, that's also probably not normal too. I'm like, Okay, this yeah. makes sense. <laughs> I love that. Sometimes I, I will say sometimes it's pre-workout, like the caffeine in the pre-workout. Sometimes oh, yeah. that'll stimulate things and get them going. <laughs> That's a good point. I've always said pre-workout poops are the best poops. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Um, Marissa, that reminds me though, what you said about that is our third layer. So we talked about the layers of the public floor. Um that third layer where we think about our pelvic floor muscles, there's also hip muscles in there. So we can actually feel a muscle that turns on in your hip internally and externally. So I describe it as you're like washing both sides of a window, you know? So if something's going on with your hip, like if your glutes not activating right, or your hip is really tight, um, then that could impact your pelvic floor as well. And that could also lead to some issues with like triggering this knee urgency for bowel movement or having difficulty with constipation. So hip muscles play a big role with your pelvic floor muscles. They're right in there together. Yeah, totally. Mm. Awesome. So I think, um, I guess let's go through kind of like the list of, of diagnoses or like the big issues that we see with pelvic floor dysfunction. So we've kind of gone over, okay, what are kind of some warning signs and things that like, Hey, they're, these are probably not normal things kind of where those things progress to, if not treated or taken care of. And you know, what, what kind of diagnoses and issues are we looking out for with pelvic floor health? Yeah. So as a pelvic floor physical therapist, we treat all sorts of things. Um, so let's start with some of the biggest ones I'll see will be urine leakage. So leaking urine, if you really have to go to the the bathroom and you're trying to hold it, like that urgency comes on and you just can't make it to the toilet in time. Sometimes that will happen. Or sometimes people will have what we call overflow incontinence. So they'll just won't be able to hold it, won't be able to hold it. And then they'll just end up, you know, peeing themselves right before the toilet, which can be hard for some people. I think it can really, a lot of these um, symptoms can bring up feelings of shame, but they happen and they happen for a reason. You know, we know that muscles are related with that. So um, they can definitely be helped, but that's something that we'll see uh, stress urinary incontinence is a big one. So what that basically means is that you're leaking urine anytime there's pressure or force going through your body. So basically muscles in your body, your pelvic floor, we want to be able to accept load and we want to be able to transmit load throughout our body. So that's what our pelvic floor is working to do. So if there's jumping, running, um, even just walking, landing heavily on your feet, whatever it is, if you are not able to control your pelvic floor, if the other muscles around your pelvic floor, like your core muscles, your glutes, muscles in your legs, if they're not functioning properly, all that force has to go somewhere and it might go into your pelvic floor and that might jar kind of how your pelvic floor is able to support your bladder or control any urine 
um, that needs to be controlled by the sphincter. So it could leak out of the sphincter there. So that's really a big one we see. Um, I know that, I think that's most commonly thought of, especially in the postpartum community during pregnancy, because during pregnancy, our bodies change. Christina, I know you know that. Um, <laughs> and it's totally normal for our bodies to change, of course. And so that can be how that that can impact how our pelvic floor functions just because the way our bodies hold pressure and load is changing. How it holds our weight is basically changing. So that's a big one there. And there are studies that show that if you have, for example, urine leaking during pregnancy, then you have a higher likelihood of having it postpartum. Um, and that's not to scare anyone. That's just out there to say that you can actually start doing things for your pelvic floor even without having kids, like there are things that you can do for your pelvic floor just by being aware of them and working and learning how to use them properly to manage these symptoms before they get to a point where it's really impacting your quality of life. So I'm kind of jumping ahead, Marissa, in your question. A lot of these conditions and symptoms that we're talking about, um, because I think society is just like, oh, it's normal. Don't worry about yeah. it. What happens is then we see the patients that come in and are like, oh, I've been dealing with this for like nine to 10 years or, you know, oh, I, I had this maybe 20 years ago when I had my first kid and then it got better. And then I had three or four more kids and I just didn't have time. And now it's been 35 years and I'm going to the bathroom, you know, 20 times a day and I can't poop and paint pain with sex, like so many things happen. Um, so addressing it right on at the beginning is so important. So, and having conversations like this with you guys is so important. Um, yeah, not so, yeah. only that though, not only that though, but like, you know, just, I, I I'm jumping ahead too now, but basically the, the fix for a lot of this stuff is so much simpler than <laughs> you might think. And I want to, I want to stop on uh, stress urinary incontinence just for a second, because I think it's really relevant to our audience. So our podcast is the barbell lifestyle podcast. So we're all about lifting weights. And so when you say the word load, our audience's mind jumps to load equals barbell or load equals dumbbell. Right. And so it's like, we have, we're transferring load across the body. And I want to just talk for a second about, you know, how lifting is going to impact the pelvic floor. And really what was interesting, what you said was if the core muscles, the glute muscles, the thigh muscles are not functioning properly, then the force may get, you know, kind of unevenly transferred to the pelvic floor and it might be bearing more of the load. So when you're doing like, let's, let's imagine the most common thing, a barbell squat and you're bearing down, you have all this weight on your back. I think it's equally as important to say, yes, we want this, this mind muscle connection with the pelvic floor and we want to be able to contract, relax it and know what that should be doing in exercises like that or any, any load bearing exercise. But also I think you pointed to the importance of, we need to have a mind muscle connection with the rest of our muscles in the lower body, the upper body, the trunk being able to contract, relax and control the muscles in our entire body. So that's really cool because there's so much that we can do to prevent these issues that really just comes down to like, okay, are our glutes activated before we're doing this heavy hip thrust? Are our muscles warm? Have we learned how to actually contract them and produce force from them before we're jumping into throwing 200 pounds on the bar on our back, right? So I think it's really interesting that you, you pointed that out. And I don't know if you have anything else to add on that or with lifting specifically, I would love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I am. Um, I'm so happy you're asking me this because it's a question I get a lot. And um, I see it a lot with patients who come in and are like, I really want to get back to these activities, but maybe I can never do them again. And that's just not true. We can absolutely lift. Um, we can absolutely do exercise. It's there's so many benefits for it. I will say that there are studies out there. So there is evidence that shows that exercising, exercising women in particular, so weightlifters, for example, do have um, three times as many, as three times the risk, I should say, of stress urinary incontinence um, than women who don't have that active of a lifestyle. That being said, does that mean that we should not exercise? No, of course not. But it's going back to exactly what you said, where form is important, right? And I think that's what you guys like preach all day, every day, which is so great because 
how our body is transmitting load is like the baseline knowledge point out there that should be out there for anyone who's trying to take care of themselves. So form is going to be important because if we can control how our muscles are controlling our body, then we can better distribute that load and not increase pressure or force into our pelvic floor. The second thing I want to say about that is yes, your pelvic floor is important. Um, And I think sometimes we see two sides of the coin, right? We see a lot of people who are like, oh, I'm never going to talk about the pelvic floor and I'm not ever going to do anything about it. And then you have people who are like, okay, I need to do a thousand Kegels in this (laughs) amount of time. And that's going to, you know, get me back to running, but never are they actually working on there are other muscles around their pelvic floor to help them get back to running. If you have a super strong pelvic floor, great. But if, like you said, your glutes aren't functioning or you're not breathing properly or your core is not stabilizing you, that's not going to stop you, unfortunately, from having low back pain or having urine leaks or things like that. Um, so that is even kind of where our philosophy at Pelvital with our pro- product flight comes into is that we basically have all this great clinical data that knows that it can really improve your pelvic floor strength. But we know that that's not the only thing, right? It's so important to understand and look at each person as an individual. So that's why we have services like pelvic PTs to talk you through what the right next step for you is. Can you see a provider? Can you go back into activity with guidance from like a coach who knows things about pregnancy or postnatal, for example. Um, So using your resources is really important there. But yes, I think you hit it on the nail where being able to transmit load is going to be very important and being able to, I, I think the right word here would be like consciously use your pelvic flora, consciously use your glute muscles, use your Um, abdominal muscles and use them properly, like time them properly with your movements, that's really going to be key. So instead of like, you know, just adding load to your squats, see if you can really control that load and do it well before you up your reps, before you add more weight Um, and understanding that what you're doing for your body, even though it may not feel like, oh my God, I did five sets of you know, however many reps, maybe you didn't get to that many reps or that many sets, but slowing down and pay attention, paying attention to how you're using these muscles is going to be even more beneficial for you in the long run. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's why Marissa and I are very keen on having proper movement, being able to control the load throughout. And it doesn't matter what you can lift if you're not activating the correct muscles. And so I think it's, it's a lot to think about Mm -hmm. when you're doing a movement. Um, but it is really important if you are suffering from like urinary incontinence when you are lifting. So it is just that extra layer that you will have to focus on, um, to eventually get to the point where you feel comfortable in the gym and you don't have too many issues or any issues anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, you know, there are things that you can do to help you manage how your pelvic floor is functioning. So if you are leaking urine, for example, with lifting certain weight, maybe you're lifting like X amount of weight and you're not leaking, but then you add 20 pounds and you are, you know, is it that the 20 pounds more are too heavy for you? Maybe it's more that you're just not able to control or support those muscles, support your bladder and the sphincter control there is more difficult when you have increased weight, right? So back down and see if you can work on exhaling during the lift. So anytime you're lifting anything heavy, I say this even to my moms who have to pick up their kids as their kids suddenly like do that thing, you know, called aging and growing and and they become heavier and they're carrying them around all the time. I, it's the same principle for them as it is for, you know, my college aged athlete, um, is exhaling throughout that lift, especially if you have any pelvic floor symptoms, that's really where you want to be doing that. So how can you know if your pelvic floor is functioning properly or not? I'm going to say a little tip or trick, but of course, if you have any pain or discomfort with inserting a tampon, totally disregard this, talk to your doctor. Um, but 
if you want to know, is my pelvic floor turning on properly? What's my strength like? This is not a surefire way to do it, but just for your interest, what you can do is you can take a tampon. This is for women out there, or I should say vagina owners. So if you have a vagina, you can insert the tampon and just maybe either lying on your back comfortably. If you're standing, it might look different because gravity is going to impact us and we'll pull down on our muscles. So you can start lying on your back. Just hold onto the string lightly. You're not pulling on it. You're just holding on it to see what's going to happen. And you're going to imagine like you're lifting a blueberry or you're lifting the underwear that you've got on or whatever it is up and in towards your belly button. So imagine that you're doing a Kegel or a pelvic floor contraction. Another way to think about it is imagine that you're drawing your sit bones together to meet in the middle. It's a ton of different imagery, you know, cues out there and just see if you can feel that string move upwards towards your belly button. And then afterwards, see if you can consciously let it go. So you should be able to lift, you should be able to let go, and then you should be able to let go even a little further. And that's what we call bearing down. So we should feel like you've got your baseline where the string is, you should feel it lift, feel it drop, and then feel it drop a little further when you're consciously trying to do that. And just see if you can do that. Sometimes people will be like, wait, I'm telling myself to lift this, but nothing's happening. And that doesn't automatically mean that you have like a terrible pelvic floor. It just might mean exactly what we talked about before, where it's like, all right, well, when was the last time you did thought about this and did this? Maybe it's just about teaching your brain how to turn those muscles on. So some, something to think about. I love that. And I think, um, especially with the, just talking about lifting so much with, with these examples, um, I think, you know, anyone who has just curiosity about like where they might be at with their pelvic floor health, if they haven't already seen a professional, which I'm going to guess is 98% of the people listening. Uh, I give that a shot, but I also want to kind of just better define you know, what is good pelvic floor control in a a lifting context. And there's a couple of things that I want to go over here because I think uh, there's a lot of stuff that goes around in the lifting community that aligns with what you're saying, but there's also some stuff that goes completely against it. So the first question I guess would be, you know, if you're not seeing any pain or you're not leaking yourself on a heavy squat, you kind of answered this one. So like where mm-hmm. if there's a certain load, you basically want to make sure that you can control it both with not having those symptoms and uh, being able to, to lift that load and then progress on it, which is great because that aligns with the principles of progressive overload for just like not only increasing the weight that you use or increasing the reps that you do in the gym for progress, but also like, can you control the movement? Can you contract the right muscles for that? So I think that's very much in line. And then there's, um, what you were saying basically about exhaling during the the effort portion. So a lot of personal training certifications and basically how lifting is taught to a lot of people is you inhale on the negative or the, the portion where your muscles are stretching. And when your muscles are contracting, you're exhaling with effort. It's always the E and E together, right? Mm -hmm. So we teach that. And that's very much in line with what you're saying for the pelvic floor, which is awesome. Now here's where things kind of go wrong is with heavy barbell movements, the squat, the deadlift, power lifters, the term bearing down, we actually teach with the Valsalva maneuver. So if you guys listening are not familiar, the Valsalva maneuver is essentially a method of getting more force out of your abdominal region against a belt or with a heavy barbell movement in order to actually see, you know, a bigger total or a bigger number go up with your squat or your deadlift by bearing down on your pelvic floor and by holding your breath instead of exhaling. So this is kind of opposite from that. And so a lot of the stuff that goes, we went through in our certification was like, don't teach this Valsalva maneuver. Don't use the Valsalva maneuver, but we have all of these lifters who might be competing in competitive powerlifting and they might need to be, to be using this. So I guess my question would be, you know, for those people, if they're not seeing or feeling any pain or, you know, discomfort or leaking when they're doing this, are they good? Or is there like something that they should also be looking out for in this situation? That is a great question. Um, 
answer is not going to be as easy, right. As I yeah. like it to be, but, um, essentially the goal of Valsava from like a PT standpoint is that it's almost, it's almost like your body, you're helping your body quote unquote cheat to help you have more stability in your trunk so you can lift more. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's generally through a short period of time. So our breathing muscles or diaphragm work very closely with our pelvic floor and our abdominal muscles. So by doing the Valsava, it's almost like we're increasing. We are, I shouldn't say almost, we are increasing that pressure in our trunk that can then allow us to take more load for a brief period of time. So as you guys know, as we all know, that's not something that's we should be sustainably using, but for something like um, heavy lifting for that short period of time during that movement, that's definitely a strategy that's used. So is that necessarily a bad thing to do in that state? No. What it means is that you've got to have a really strong core. So when we think core, we often think about doing planks, doing crunches, which are great, especially planks are a great way to turn on your deep abdominals and get some pelvic floor activation. But we know that our core is a lot more than that. It involves our muscles in our back. Your pelvic floor is one of your main four core muscles and your diaphragm, which is the muscle that helps you breathe. So being able to keep those muscles strong and working together and just daily function and your normal lifting is going to be ideal so that when you are doing a Valsava and you are increasing pressure, that pressure is still going to be properly maintained versus kind of an, an easy example, I should say, is like a hernia, right? So a hernia is often through an abdominal wall um, when the organ will almost people say pop out. It's not actually popping out. It's more that there's laxity in that area, in that tissue. So that where whatever is inside your trunk and your abdomen, it's always going to go towards the like path of least resistance if there's increased pressure in it. So if you are holding your breath and you're adding a lot of weight, if your core isn't strong, so if your abdominals aren't able to take that pressure, then you might have a hernia because all of that has to go somewhere. Or on the other side, if your pelvic floor is not super strong, then all that pressure has to go somewhere and might go down and it might lead to urine leaks. It might lead to pressure in your pelvic floor, um, prolapse, things like that. So basically answer to that is no, not necessarily. It's not a bad thing. And if you are not having symptoms, I wouldn't necessarily worry about it, but I think a good thing to understand from this episode, and I think you guys are doing a great job of of highlighting this is just being aware of the fact that your pelvic floor is part of your core and that we want that to function properly with your other muscles so that you can continue to do things like a balsava. So you can continue to compete and lift weights. Um, My little like rule of thumb, again, this is not right for everyone, but just kind of a general thing to understand is if your pelvic floor, for example, is not able to lift through its full range against gravity. So what that means is if you're doing the tampon test and you're at home and you're standing and you feel like that string isn't able to move all the way up. Again, this is something if you are having any pelvic floor symptoms, I'd highly recommend you see a pelvic floor physical therapist or doctor so they can really help guide you with this and test you specifically. But if you're not able to lift your pelvic floor against gravity and contract against gravity, generally for my patients that I was rehabbing back to this heavy weight lifting goals is you're always going to exhale anytime you're lifting something heavy until you're able to be above what we call a grade three, which is that lifting against gravity. If you are able to lift against gravity and hold and your strength is good, your endurance is good, you have good fast twitch abilities, meaning you're able to turn on your pelvic floor muscles quickly and slowly, then you are able to add more pressure there. And that's when I would kind of wean them back into that. So something to think about is, If you are, if that's one of your goals and you are, um, especially in this community, right? Lifting heavy, understanding that your pelvic floor is part of the bigger picture and just being conscious of if you are having any of these symptoms, it's kind of like what Marissa said before, 
there are things that you can do right away to help you with that. So maybe that's where you back off the weight a little bit and you start exhaling and you just practice there first. And then you gradually increase the load until you can, you know, add maybe a little bit more load and not have those symptoms and see how that goes working on your other core muscles and taking guidance from your coach to help you with that. Yeah. So it's kind of like, you know, if, if there's a weight that's too heavy for you and, you know, you're in this position and drawing an analogy here, you know, your, your ego lifting, it's too heavy. You're having issues with it or pain. It's kind of the same thing about checking yourself, um, with, with the load that you're using. So for this circumstance in particular, it's going down in weight to, something that you can exhale through that effort portion with. Um, and then from there building up control from that. So same thing, if like you're using a super heavy weight and you're just ego lifting and you're doing a partial range of motion and it just looks ugly, you check yourself, you go down to a weight that you can do a full range of motion. You can do it with full control and then you progress up from there. So that's kind of, is that a good analogy for what you're kind of saying there? Yeah, I think that's perfect. And I think another way to think about it is, if you were doing, let's just keep it easy and say you were just doing a squat, you know, if you were doing a squat and you had knee pain, should we really be pushing through and doing more squats with that weight? Probably not. You'd probably be like, Ooh, my knee kind of hurts. Like, let me back off. Let me make sure I'm doing my form properly. I say we, I, I always say we should treat our pelvic floor the same way. If you're leaking urine with a squat with certain weight, or if you have pain or feel pressure or anything like that, that doesn't count as one of your reps. That yeah. doesn't count as a good rep. You are going to back off. You're going to figure out how to treat that, whether it's seeing a medical provider, whether it's asking your coach, whatever it is to help guide you, it doesn't count as one of your good reps. I like that. I like that a lot mm -hmm. uh, because it's like, we kind of, it's like, does this count as a rep or like, you know, it was, oh, it was a half rep, you know, so they helped me with my elbows or whatever. It's like, no, this is, this is where you draw that line. I love that. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So we stopped for a bit on stress urinary incontinence to really talk about lifting and everything that that entailed. So I'm glad we took the time on that because it's super relevant to our audience, but I do want to go over the other stuff that could be going on with the pelvic floor that uh, we should be aware of as well. So I know you mentioned prolapse already. We can go into that and anything else that I might be blanking out on. Yeah. So I think prolapse is a great one too. Um, I think it's something that people have heard of, but don't always know exactly what it is. So prolapse is a big one that we will see. Um, and it is essentially when in a vital organ, so it could be your bladder, it could be your uterus, um, cervix, could be uh, your rectum. So when one of these organs is descending down a canal, so um, it could be descending down your, um, whether it's the anus that is descending down through or whether it's through the vagina. Um, that's when people will come in and be like, Oh my God, is my bladder going to fall out of my body? You know, and that can be a really scary feeling. Um, it's not going to fall out of your body. Essentially what's happening is the muscles, your pelvic floor muscles that help support your organs that sit there are either have lost tone or they've gotten weak, or they're not able to support that, um, all that stuff in there, all your vital organs in there. And so what happens is that it has to go somewhere. And so sometimes it will fall down. Uh, that I think ties in actually really well with what we talked about too. Sometimes people will have those symptoms with specific activities, such as adding load, because it goes right into what we talked about where all that pressure and force has to go somewhere. So mm -hmm. it can go downwards. Um, I do want to make it clear though, there, I think there can be a lot of fear around, especially in the postpartum community, especially um, as women get older or men as well as we get older, we feel like, oh my gosh, our muscles are getting worse. Um, there actually is not strong evidence to support weightlifting and like increased physical activity with an increased risk in prolapse, which is huge. So that is really important to understand what is something that is a risk factor is high occupational load. So working strenuous jobs, a very um, physically active job can increase your risk. But again, having an increased risk doesn't mean that you're doomed. It's just something that we can be aware of to help control. Um, so prolapse is one that we will see here and see a lot. So 
what kind of symptoms do you feel with the prolapse? Because we just talked about what it might look like. So as a medical provider, when I'm assessing that, I might see a bulge appear, whether at the entrance of your vagina, a little bit inside or outside. Same with um, at the anus, I might see uh, a bulge appear there when you are bearing down. Um, so again, through the Valsava, and that's actually how we test it. We actually have you hold your breath and push down and we see, is anything bulging? So that is from a medical provider standpoint. The symptoms that we generally hear are, I feel something kind of heavy down there. I feel pressure, um, something feels uncomfortable. Sometimes people will say when they're in the shower, they can physically feel something there. So those are kind of the symptoms that we'll hear associated with prolapse. Yeah, that's a big do one. You, <laughs> so I'm, I'm just speaking from like personal experience. Do you feel like some people maybe have like temporary prolapse or symptoms like during their menstrual cycle. So that's something that I've experienced. Like my husband's like, you know, I'll be laying on the floor or something <laughs> and he's like, you know, are you okay? And I'm like, no, like I'm cramping really bad. I feel like I'm dying. And I feel like my organs are going to come out of my body. Mm -hmm. And it's something that I experienced during my cycle and like no other time. So is that yeah. normal or like not a well, common or? <laughs> yeah, it can be, it can be. Um, and everyone experiences like menstrual cycle symptoms differently, but exactly what you said, uh, our hormones are really changing through that whole cycle. So that can also impact how our joint pain shows up, how our pelvic floor responds. Um, so if it's temporary and it's not like worsening or not worsening with certain activities, then that's probably okay. Unless of course it's impacting your quality of life to a point where you'd want to see someone. Yeah. Super interesting. Yeah. So are we missing, um, well, actually, you know what, I want to say this now because we're 50 minutes in and I think it's important. And this is kind of the theme of the whole episode here. And really, you know, what you caught yourself with Christina was, you know, is it, is that normal or what, well, is it common? And, and so the difference between common and normal and all of these pelvic floor issues is that a lot of them are common, um, but it is not normal. And I think what you said, Shravya earlier about how like, oh, we just write it off and say, oh, you know, that happens to everyone. Oh, you, you pee yourself when you jump. Yeah. That's just normal for moms after they've had like their first or second kid. Like that is the standard that people kind of set their expectations at, because that's like, just passed down through generations. Like that's just what you have to deal with. That's just what you have to expect. But what we need everybody here listening to know is that just because something's common doesn't mean it's normal. And the way to fix it is actually so much simpler than, you know, we might think. So uh, before we move into the solutions, is there any, I feel like I'm blanking on like any other pelvic floor dysfunction or disorders yeah. uh, before we dive into that. Yeah. So there's a whole host. Um, some of them might include, like we talked about difficulty emptying your bladder or bowels, um, pain with anything, uh, any abdominal pain during, you know, activities such as bathroom habits with exercise, um, with sex. Let's talk about sex real quick, uh, because that's so important, but pain with sex is never normal. And I have had people come into my office and just be like, I didn't know that that was not normal because I've had this my whole life. And how am I supposed to know <sighs> what's normal if I've never experienced anything else, you know? Yeah. Um, and that can be a very emotional journey for people. It can impact uh, relationships. It can impact how we view ourselves, it can impact our sexual arousal and desire. Um, and generally, we rarely see these symptoms alone. Um, sometimes we'll see someone with just stress urinary incontinence or something like that. But a lot of the times, someone who's coming in might have multiple of these symptoms showing up because we know that this group of muscles work so closely with other muscles in our body and work so closely with these daily um, important functions. So definitely... I think the biggest thing is, and I know we're going to get into this, is advocate for yourself. But pain with sex, whether it is pain upon insertion, so whatever type of sexual intimacy you're involved in, if it does involve penetration, pain like superficially, burning pain, burning with urination, sometimes pelvic floor dysfunction can actually show up as symptoms of a UTI. So that's where you have some uh, women, for example, who 
just keep taking antibiotics for UTI and it can really mess with your gut health and all of that, but no one's really checking out their pelvic floor and having a tight pelvic floor, um, having muscles there that aren't lengthening or stretching properly when they need to can actually cause discomfort, burning, itchiness, things like that, that feel similar to a UTI. Um, so that's just one, one thing I wanted to put out there. I know that it's not necessarily uh, related with the weightlifting, but there are, um, it can be, I should say, because sometimes when we have people who are experiencing this pain, generally we expect to see tight pelvic floor muscles or shortened pelvic floor muscles. And that can exist for anyone out there. Um, so deep pain, super, superficial pain, whatever it is, don't doubt yourself and you're not alone. Um, it's very, very common. It's one in four women will deal with some type of um, sexual pain at some time in their life. And for some women it's temporary and for some women it's long-term and it can be helped. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I guess, you know, the next thing to talk about is how do we solve these issues of, you know, stress urinary incontinence, pelvic pain, you know, all of these different things. We've said a number of times in this episode, oh, the solution is so much easier than you think. Okay. Well then let's, let's give our audience a taste of that. <laughs> yes. I love that. So I think I want to say, I want to repeat something you just said a couple minutes ago, which was just because something is common does not mean that it's normal. And I think we should just keep repeating that over and over again, because it's so, so, so important. Um, and it, to even take that one step further, because it is common, there's actually a lot of people out there who focus on all this stuff specifically, like myself included, but there are so many other medical doctors, there are nutritionists, there are coaches, for example, there are counselors who specifically work with um, people who have pain with sex with people who have prolapse symptoms or trauma with childbirth or whatever it is. These can be really emotional things because as a society, we just haven't like grown to talk about them. So understanding that just because others may have it, it's not something you have to live with. Um, and there are solutions for it. So the question you asked Marissa is, is easy and hard. Um, the reason I say it's difficult is because one solution does not fit all, especially with the pelvic floor. So the easy solution I will say is that there are so many more resources out there for you than you think. And the key is, is that we just all need to really keep advocating for ourselves and really just be, be able to talk about it. Um, that's where, you know, I've had patients in my clinic where they have low back pain and they've been dealing with it for years and years and they've gotten all these treatments and they're just not getting better. And I'll say, so I want to ask you some personal questions if you don't mind. And I'll start asking them questions about, you know, do you have any bowel issues, trouble going to the bathroom, any pain with urination? And they're like, why are you asking me this? Like <laughs> I came here for my back, like this is weird. And, and that's, you know, where I kind of have to explain that they can be interrelated. So Continuing to ask those questions and seek out resources, I think is important for everyone. And that's really just where this education piece comes out. Um, but when you do see, seek out a, whether it's a pelvic floor physical therapist, whether it's um, a company like us, like Flight Up Pelvic All with services and products that make it easy to do it at home, in addition to being connected to clinicians, um, whether you just read blog articles online, you know, there's so much out there online as well, podcasts, so many things out there. Once you really find someone who's able to do a full assessment and really guide you towards a program, you can really make improvements and it can be life-changing because these are things that not only impact us physically, but impact us mentally. And so going to the gym and weightlifting, I've had patients come in and be like, oh, I can't wear any of my light colored leggings, you know, because I'm just going to pee myself and everyone's going to see it's like little things like that. That's frustrating. Mm -hmm. So making sure that you're advocating for yourself is step one, step two, getting that assessment and figuring out what it is that you need. Um, 
is important. And I want to encourage people to advocate for themselves in the sense that if you feel uncomfortable with anything, whether it's an internal assessment or otherwise, still go see a provider because we 100% want you to be comfortable. And we're always, always here to find the right solution for you. So if you're like, well, I can only come in once and then I have to move away and I just can't come in, you know, let's figure out something for you to do and take away with you for home so that you can start making improvements right away. Um, so kind of a convoluted answer, but basically what I want to say is that improvements can be easier than you think. Surgery doesn't have to be involved. Um, there don't have to be these, you know, scary ideas of internal exams. I think sometimes like going to the OB for us women, OBGYN can be intimidating with the speculum. We don't use speculums. I hate speculums, <laughs> um, but we just, we are here to help you. And most of your doctors will be there as well to do the same. If you don't feel like you're being heard or respected, 100% seek out care somewhere else. Um, and that I think goes beyond medical doctors and goes beyond physical therapists. That's just any type of industry that you're in, right? You want to be respected and heard. Um, so a really roundabout answer to your question. <laughs> so I think the other thing too, to think about is, you know, you could throw out all these different ways that you could quote unquote fix certain things. But I think it's important that in before you do that is like, well, what's causing this or what is the issue? And then what are the things that we can implement? But one of the things that you and I had talked about previously was, you know, maybe you're not able to see someone right away and you're maybe not able to get down to the root cause. But one of the things that you and I had talked about was breathing and something that's super simple that you could focus on and see if that helps. And if it doesn't like, okay, yeah, maybe I do need to make an appointment. So if you want to touch on that, I think that'd be really, really important. Yeah, absolutely. So breathing is really important. As we talked about, the diaphragm is a muscle that helps you breathe and works very closely with your pelvic floor. So when you are inhaling, what happens is your diaphragm is going to contract and it's actually going to go down and your pelvic floor is going to go down with it. So they move together. When you're exhaling, your diaphragm is going to lift and your pelvic floor is going to lift. So they basically work in this piston movement to manage pressure inside your trunk, kind of the recurring theme of what we're talking about. So what's important is being able to breathe properly throughout all sorts of activities that might include not only exercise, not only running, but getting up out of a chair, getting out of bed, realizing, just starting to notice throughout your day, am I holding my breath at all? Are there any times where I'm kind of not really thinking I'm really focused in my work and I'm shallow breathing with my chest, understanding what that might mean is you're not necessarily using those muscles that are part of your core that work with your pelvic floor to help you breathe. So what does proper breathing look like? It involves three stages. So one is going to be your belly is going to expand outwards Two, your ribs are going to expand laterally, meaning out to the side. So you should feel like your ribs are flaring apart. And then third, your chest will rise. So all three of those things need to happen to really allow us to get the expansion that we need within our trunk to allow our pelvic floor to properly function as well. So if you are, you know, getting out of bed tomorrow, that's my goal for everyone is just to notice, like, are you kind of holding your breath and then using your abs to really like push you up and sit up? Or can you exhale during that movement? Can you catch yourself throughout the day and see, are you breathing with your belly? Are you using your ribs? How about what's your chest is doing and incorporating that into your day to day, making that your normal way of breathing. I love that. I'm actually, I was sitting here while you were talking about that and I was just breathing that way. And the other part about it too, is it's like, you know, using the diaphragmatic breathing and just like deep breathing, it's relaxing. Like mm -hmm. how many of us struggle with anxiety and worry and just like being so like on edge all throughout the day. So many of us. And like the other day, actually, I think it was yesterday. You know, I, ha I have this tendency where like, as soon as I sit down, I'm like, ah, I need to start working immediately. And I need to start doing all these things that are on my mind, but I'm trying to slow down that process in the morning and just like breathe. So I, I literally sat here in this chair yesterday, closed my eyes and just like took 
five, maybe two minutes, maybe five. I don't know exactly the time to meditate and like to do that deep breathing. And like, there's so many benefits beyond the, just the pelvic floor of like, oh, yeah. you know, just relaxing your nervous system because like that will go into your parasympathetic or your sympathetic tone. So like if your body is in this stressed state, so this is the sympathetic fight or flight state, you've probably learned about it in anatomy or physio- uh, physiology. If you're listening to this and you're kind of unfamiliar, but basically it's when you're tense, you're tight, you're like worked up. If you stay in that state all the time, what do you think that that's going to do with your pelvic floor muscles and how you breathe and how all of these things are tied together and the tone of all your muscles just going to be tense all the time. So I think the breathing is a really good way to like set that tone in your body of like, Hey, like we can relax here. We can contract things appropriately. We don't need to be tense and tight everywhere all the time. And it alleviates it. You know, it can, it can feed into the pelvic floor health. It can also like alleviate tension headaches, like all the things. So like, just kind of seeing how like the tips and tricks for this go full circle rather than just like, Oh, only do this for your pelvic floor. Like, no, there's so much else that that's going to affect. That's a great point. And that even goes into another tip we can throw out there is let your belly go. Just like we clench our jaw, just like we clench everything else. I think we've been taught in this world to like suck it in. Right. Ladies. Like, but (laughs) when you're just hanging around the house, whatever you're doing, let your belly go. Your bellies are beautiful and they're built to be soft and to be able to breathe. Um, when you're using your muscles, it might be different, but otherwise really see if you can let that go because we actually have connective tissue that runs from our pelvic floor into our abdominal muscles and connect them. So if you're clenching your belly all the time, your pelvic floor muscles might also be clenching. So that breathing that you were talking about, Marissa, so important, I think for, for multiple things, like you said. Awesome. Yeah. I love that. Um, I feel like this whole episode has gone so much more full circle than I anticipated it to. And like going into a topic like this, we're like, we are clearly not the experts. And so we bring the expert on, but I'm like, how, you know, how is this episode going to go kind of having the nerves about like, oh, are people even going to listen about pelvic floor health? But like after going through, you know, all of the, all of the things, all of the issues, how it applies to lifting and then how it's so deeply integrated with every other aspect of our lives is so awesome. So if you've made it to this part in the episode, I just want to say thank you for listening. And we, we really hope that, you know, you guys have been getting as much value from this as we have just, you know, sitting here chatting with you. So (laughs) I guess like my next question is, is there anything else that you feel like we have skipped over or haven't touched on that needs to be brought to light in this conversation around pelvic floor health? I think you guys did a great job um, asking the right questions. I'm so glad to be on here talking pelvic health, everything. It's something that I love to do. So thank you both for having me on here. Um, I I'm going to throw out one more thing when you were talking about like actionable things that we can do. And I just totally blanked on this. This is a great one. There's a phrase out there and it says squeeze before you sneeze. So (laughs) Christy is laughing. She's like, we've already talked about this. (laughs) I think we have. So what does that mean? Sometimes we leak urine when we sneeze, when we cough, when we laugh, Um, this might be with exercise. If you're lifting up your kid, if you're lifting up dumbbells, all of that stuff we talked about with load and force, something that you can do to help with that is you can just do a gentle pelvic floor contraction, also known as a Kegel, do a gentle Kegel right before and during that action. So we call it a knack. So it's almost like, okay, you hear, you, you feel a cough coming on, or you feel the sneeze coming on and you're going to take a breath. You're going to just gently squeeze. So imagine that jellyfish movement you're squeezing and you're lifting up towards your belly button. If you're sitting on a chair right now, you can imagine the area between your sit bones and see if you can just imagine you're lifting those muscles in and up away from the chair. And that's something you can practice. So if you're someone who has urine leaking with those activities, you can actually sit in a chair. You can even roll up a small towel and put it between your sit bones so you can really feel the lift away from the towel and see if you can lift, cough, 
hold it there and then feel if you can drop it into the chair. So that's like an actionable exercise you can do, right? But if you're out and about, of course, you're not sitting on a towel, you're not sitting on a chair, you feel a sneeze coming on, squeeze, sneeze, and then let it go <laughs> and then keep on moving. So that's something that you can kind of apply right away. I've had patients come in and it's like one visit and they just learn how to do that. No one's taught them that or shown them that. And they're like, cool, I'm fine. It's like, great. <laughs> you made my job so easy. So that's a great little, I feel like that's a good last tidbit to throw out there. Yeah. Right, so we've got squeeze and sneeze, advocate for yourself. And just because something's common doesn't mean it's normal. Yes. And breathe. Lots of breathing. And breathe. Lots of breathing. <laughs> yeah. I actually want to, um, I want to have you talk about the, the product a little bit that you guys have. I want to just like commend you for like, just the fact that, you know, I feel like a lot of times we have medical practitioners, but then we also have, you know, you have a product on the market. So this could easily have turned into a full plug for your product. And like, that's all, all we could have talked about. Right. So I just want to like, just point out the fact that like Shravya is so holistically focused on just pelvic floor health as a whole, the knowledge, the education behind it. And yes, there's a product on the market, but like, it's not the solution for everybody. And she knows that, and she's not here to, you know, sell every single person listening to this episode on that product. But I do want to give that product some light um, so that people who may actually be a good candidate for it can get that benefit. So I know you guys have like a ref the referral um, situation that we've set up for, for my client's team and then um, the, the device itself. So could you just walk us through that quickly? Yeah, absolutely. That means so much to hear that from you guys. Um, I am first and foremost a pelvic floor physical therapist. This is something I've done for a while now. I've had my own experiences with um, pelvic pain, with other issues. So I am always going to focus on the individual. Um, and I think that's what really sets our company apart. We are a startup team. We're super small. I was employee number six, and I think we're at six. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, out of the six of us, two of us are um, public floor therapists. So we really are not you know, out there just to get the product to everyone and anyone. We really want to help the people we feel like can help. And we, of course, understand that there's so many people out there who it's not right for. Um, but we don't want to leave them floating. You know, we don't want to just leave the people who are looking and advocating for themselves, looking for care, come across our website and say, well, this isn't right for you, so too bad. So we actually offer programs like Ask a PT. So you can actually call into us. It's free. There's no pressure, no sales pressure. It's just completely to provide answers and resources. And you can talk to the other pelvic PT on our staff, Leah, and she's great. She will just listen to you, give you some advice. If flight is appropriate for you, which is our product, then she'll make that recommendation if she feels like it's not. And sometimes it's both. Sometimes it's, we really think you should see your healthcare provider, um, but maybe it is something that works for you. Uh, we refer out to other docs all the time because we want people getting the care that they deserve. So we refer out to um, trusted doctors that we know, trusted PTs across the country when we can, which is really, really great to foster those relationships and meet them. Um, so we're out there. Our goal is to really get um, more people talking about the pelvic floor and provide an option for women who feel like they're active, who maybe don't have time to go into a clinic all the time and want something that's evidence-based that has good cl clinical data behind it to help them with their pelvic floor strength and stress urinary incontinence. So the device itself is called Flight. Um, Flight is an intravaginal device, meaning it's got a wand that is inserted into the vagina and um, a separate little controller that it attaches to. At this time, it's only available for women, though we are hoping to expand to men at some time in the future. So um, again, our goal is just to like improve pelvic health care across, across the uh, whole realm. So hopefully we'll get there. But at this time, Flight has great clinical data. We've done two um, robust studies, one in the US, one in Norway with two-year follow-ups. And all these studies have demonstrated really fantastic results for improving pelvic floor muscle tone or strength and improving stress urinary incontinence. So the cool thing about that is 
our whole goal with the design was to keep it simple. So you can only use it, you only have to use it five minutes per day, five days a week. Um, and within six weeks, we saw uh, great significant um, improvements with women of all ages, really. And we found that it not only improved mild and moderate urinary incontinence. So if anyone's out there who's like, oh my gosh, I really leak a lot um, with activities, with sneezing, coughing, whatever it is, we found that women with severe incontinence actually can improve really well with flight as well, which is something that we haven't seen really in the market before. Um, it uses a totally new technology. It's the only one on the market that uses something called mechanotherapy. So that's really why we're pretty passionate about it because it's just not really known of and hasn't been used for the pelvic floor before. But it basically what it does is it adds load to your pelvic floor. So just like if you're trying to strengthen your quad muscles and your thighs and you want to add load during your squats, that's a little bit more difficult to do directly to your pelvic floor. So this technology actually adds load to your pelvic floor to increase the impact of your Kegel by 39 times, which is pretty cool. So if you are dealing with stress urinary incontinence and it's because you have pelvic floor weakness, this can be a really great resource for you. It could be a great treatment for you at home. It could be a great adjunct to whatever else you're doing. And we don't consider ourselves just a product. We consider ourselves a service because we want to address the whole person. Um, so yeah, hope, hopefully that's helpful. Um, anything else I missed guys? Where can people go to find Flight by Pelvital or find you before we ask you our last question, which is our favorite? <laughs> okay. Ooh, I'm excited. So you can just go to our website, www.flighttherapy.com. We are also on Instagram. We're super new to Instagram, but we're on there. Um, Flight Therapy is our handle. And we also have a podcast as well, um, which I'm going to have Marissa on soon. So that's called Pelvic Floor at its Core, uh, where we basically interview anyone who's in the pelvic health field um, about all sorts of things pelvic related. So you can like I said before, there's a lot of resources out there. You can definitely learn more from that. Um, but if you are specifically working with like Marissa or Christina, um, we have codes set up there where you can get a discount as well, just because we are encouraging people to go through, you know, trusted sources who can really help guide you to whether it's the right choice for you or not. Um, so yeah, flighttherapy.com. Awesome. Right. So our next question, which will be our last one, which is with something we asked all of our guests was if you could pick out your number one tip for living a sustainable, healthy lifestyle, what would it be? Ooh, that's a good question. Okay. If I could pick up my number one, I'm pausing. Cause I'm thinking <laughs> <laughs> it's a hard one to pick it just one thing. One. It is a hard one. Okay. My number one tip probably would be to, and this is probably so lame and you guys probably get really cool answers, but this is <laughs> lame is to say that self-care includes more than bubble baths and includes more than drinking wine and watching a movie. All of those things can be self-care. Trust me. I indulge in all of those, but self-care includes advocating for yourself. It includes going to your annual OBGYN or PCP appointments. Um, it includes doing things that might be out of your comfort zone because you know they're going to help you in the long run. And so that's kind of my sustainable tip out there. I think sometimes it's an uncomfortable thing to hear or to do to advocate for yourselves in these situations that are like, oh, is something really wrong? Do I really want to be talking about my bladder habits with this, you know, primary care physician or whatever it is. But I think that if we can all get into the habit of treating ourselves like we want to treat our friends, then I think we can really have a healthy lifestyle. I love that. We yeah, say the same too. stuff, like 
with self-care, we say, you know, hey, self, the greatest form of self-care is having discipline with your, with your fitness and your nutrition and really setting yourself up for, like you said, the long-term, not just the short-term of, you know, Hey, this makes me feel good in the moment, but what about what's serving you for, for a lifelong purpose? So I wholeheartedly agree. I don't think that's lame or cliche at all. Oh, good. I'm glad. (laughs) Yeah, definitely. I think, yeah, like you said, like, oh, self-care, I'm going to take a bubble bath. It's like, no, you need to schedule that doctor's appointment. (laughs) Yes, exactly. And then take the bubble bath, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Well, guys, we really hope that you enjoyed this episode. And if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to the podcast. You can find all of us on Instagram. You can find me at Christy Lynn Fit. Marissa is at Marissa Roy Fitness. And where can they find you? They can find us at Flight Therapy. Okay. Do you have a personal mm-hmm. Instagram if they want to reach out to you? I do. Um, it's going to be Shrav. So it's S H R A V with three S's and you can reach out to me there as well. Perfect. Well, thank you guys so much for listening and we hope to see you back next week.